Mm. Uh, President Buhari's inauguration of his second term cabinet of ministers last week must have overshadowed quite a few other big events uh, taking place across the country. And one of these was the Africa Policy Roadshow, which was held in Lagos, talking about uh, building what you call social investment program for Africa, including uh, what you call inclusive business. This was getting all the big boys within the world of investment and business together to talk about the roadmap, not just for Nigeria, but for Africa. So let's take a quick listen to the chairman of Citibank, uh, Dr. Olayemi Kadoso, and what he has to say regarding the cooperation between the government and the private sector. It is my, distinguished, my, di my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the African Policy Roadshow with the theme, Building Robust Policy for Increased Social Investment and Inclusive Business. The Africa Venture Philanthropy Alliance, which I represent, is a non-profit, non-partisan pan-African membership network designed to significantly increase the flow of financial, human, and intellectual capital towards addressing major social challenges on the African continent. IBAN, the Inclusive Business Action Network, on the other hand, and you'll be hearing more about them shortly, is a global initiative supporting the scaling, scaling and replication of inclusive business models. These two entities, representing social investment and inclusive business, have joined forces to promote inclusive impact first ventures. Social investment is investment that is intended to deliver a positive social capital as well as a return on the original investment. Inclusive business is a model of commercial activities that seek profit but do so by intentionally including low-income communities to actively participate in the value chain or offer services and products for the low-income population. The roadshow started off in Kenya, has moved on to Nigeria, and will shortly be going on to Ghana. The main objectives of the roadshow are, one, to provide a platform for key stakeholders to discuss challenges faced in building robust policy environment for social investment and inclusive business. Two, leverage learnings from the Asian Policy Forum that is curated by the AVPA. Three, leverage learnings from Asian policy successes facilitated by IBAN. Four, foster dialogue between government, private sector, and other, and other social investors. And five, introduce conference participants to the services provided by AVPA and IBAN. The expected outcomes of the conference will include, one, a clear mandate from participants to have AVP and IBAN work with the private sector to facilitate an initiative around policy enhancement in their respective geographies. Two, shared understanding of the policy framework gaps that are hindering growth of social investment and inclusive business development. And three, shared vision of the direction businesses and investors should follow in order to realize more inclusive, impactful societies. In addition to learning about the successes and challenges of building robust policy, we would like your active participation and candor not only during the question and answer session, but throughout the sessions. You will notice that there are markers and flip papers on your tables. Please assign a recorder and a reporter. Each table is responsible for identifying ways in which the examples of policies and strategies shared today can be customized to our Nigerian content.
Lastly, in the spirit of harnessing the power of partnerships, we look forward to working with the federal, state, private entities, and social sector to further strengthen the environment in which social investment and inclusive business can flourish in Nigeria. Before I finally close, just a word to everyone out here today. As someone who has worked extensively in the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors, I think this is a unique opportunity for us all to come together and collaborate. Many times, those of us in private sector, we fold our hands and think that the responsibility of public service is governments alone. We couldn't be further from the truth. And I believe that it's a unique opportunity that we have people who have Dr. Olayemi Kadoso, the chairman of Citibank Nigeria, and of course the chairman of African Venture Philanthropy Alliance. Uh, so he was talking about getting a robust conversation on. So let's listen to what, so what some of the panel members uh, spoke about when it comes to building on this relationship for inclusive business and social investment in Nigeria and across the planet, take a, uh, across Africa. Uh, let's take a listen. My perspective to this thing is as uh, evident in the question that I asked is, if you don't have a clear national strategy, it is harder for people to take a cue. I mean, as an academic, many years ago, I uh, offered a model in which clear national strategy impacted corporate strategy and basic strategy, how it all flowed. And I suggested that in countries, that didn't have a clear national strategy, mm -hmm. which was the case in some African countries as compared to the Asian countries I was dealing with in that group so many years ago, um, people didn't commit to long-term things, mm -hmm. as an example. My view of national strategy for Nigeria, for example, is one that takes advantage of its latent comparative advantage to have industrial policy that is specific to certain areas, one of them being agriculture, for example. So if you were to go into agriculture, mm -hmm. the nature of the strategy of a firm would be, and I don't know, we don't have the time to go into it, I'm trying to implement one right now, mm -hmm. one that goes all the way down. Oh, this mic is not working. No, go ahead, it is working. I just want her to have one by oh, her okay. side, I'm coming to her one next. One that goes all the way down, a project that we're developing as an example of this. <laughs> If we're trying to dominate setting global value chains and you take agriculture and you ask, what is your factor endowment? Now, how do you walk all the way from the farmer through manufacturing through places? How that, does that in, you know, impact the community? So clearly we do not have a national strategic, no plan, national strategic plan that for sustainable development. For you to fit into all right, that frame. First of all, I, I believe we have um, something around private sector advisory group. Um, it, is, it is actually something um, set up by the government to work with private sector to drive um, SDG goals. It's not the lack of um, having this uh, policies or strategy. It is the will and the commitment to implement. And that, is, that cuts across in everything we do and in everything you know, we are about. So the, the willingness to um, implement this is very, very critical. And you know, to the point uh, that um, someone, um, Andrew said, um, what does it take private sector to come to the party? The reality is that we already are the party. What we need to do is how do you make us dance? How do you make us dance? Because yes, we do realize that private sector has quite a lot to do in terms of um, you know, benefiting especially um, access to technology. You see a lot of our members driving conversations around um, te technology issues, whether it's Google or Microsoft or Oracle or Cisco. Great things are being done. How do you get the government to stretch out their hands to make us dance for that? Well, I think our perspective, which we've talked about the last few months, is that in this country, we should be focusing more on the sub-national level. 
So that it, 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 we're a very large country, if you believe the numbers, over 200 million. Very hard to create a national program. What we would like to see is uh, the, this impact funds become available to, to governors and states that are trying to do the right thing. So if you look, obviously we had a, His Excellency, the governor of Ecuador, he, we we're big fans of his, Kaduna governor, governor of Edo state, governor of Logan state, as some examples of governors trying to do the right thing. And if you look at the examples that we had from the Philippines, from, from India, uh, Dr. Magashi from here in Nigeria, things happen at a very local level, so it's hard to see a national program driving that. If we can get the states to really take responsibility, then there also becomes competition between the states to improve, because if the next state over is improving, you can't be left behind. So we think that going to the subnational level is critical, but we're not the only ones. The World Bank was just at the governor's forum saying, look, we'll make money available for technical assistance and capital investment at a state level if the state hit certain criteria. I think we need to do anything special if we have the right environment. Some of the people trying to serve their bottom of the pyramid will succeed. Some of them will, set, will fail. The ones that succeed are going to end up growing and are, are take the market. But I mean, I think the one thing we've learned from around the world and even in Nigeria, is if you figure out how to serve the bottom of the pyramid correctly, you'll create wealth for yourself and also for the whole, the whole community. So I don't think we need to do anything special. I mean, the one thing that's unique about Nigeria compared to so many other countries. It's the level of entrepreneurial aspiration, despite all the challenges we have. People are trying to do things, trying to do things, trying to do things. We don't need much to ignite that spark. And the CBN is saying we need to grow at 10%. We could grow at 10% a year if we just did what we're, we're, we all know, everyone here, everyone in the room knows we're capable of. I believe we have to look at um, other areas, innovative ways of looking at you know, opportunities where gaps exist. For instance, in issues of uh, the creative industry, uh, the video gaming that's about $350 billion. What role are we playing there, especially when the youth are within that bracket, that these kinds of uh, opportunities will excite them? All right, then. Thank you very much. Uh, some of the panelists are speaking to the inclusive business environment and what we need to do on the African continent as far as social investment programming, what should be our focus. But let's bring everybody back to the big story. The world markets are starting off Monday on the negative 14. It was a very troubled weekend in Paris at the G7 meeting. It was tensed. Then we'll have a trade war 2.0 between Washington and Beijing, the sabre rattling in the Middle East. The market still taking all that on board. Asian markets in negative reading early today, excluding the Indian stock market. Oil prices are down and agri-commodities are knocked. Bloomberg says the trade war between Washington and Beijing is going from very bad to much, much worse. That's quoting Bloomberg report early Monday. Washington and Beijing have now raised their earlier tariff hit levels, an amount which Bloomberg saying soybean will be part of the added duty starting September the 1st. U.S. is talking about September the 1st, October the 1st is now in, December is also in, so expect it's going to be a troubled final four months of 2019 starting from the 1st of September. Meantime, Standard Chartered says it's now likely 40% that the U.S. economy will hit a recession within the next 12 months. The earlier level of likelihood or probability was 25%. Standard Chartered says that is now 40% likelihood that the world's largest economy will hit the rocks within the next 12 months. Take that on board, everyone. So let's talk to uh, my colleague in our London studios, uh, Juliana Olayinka. Good morning, Juliana. This was a very troubled weekend. We are coming through. It uh, looks like all the uh, gloves are now off between Washington and Beijing, between President Trump and his team on one hand and President Xi Jinping in, in Beijing on the other hand. Good morning, uh, Boson. Yes, I would say that uh, a couple of years ago, it would not be unreasonable to presume that the leaders from the industrialised nations would be able to meet, come up with some sort of resolution and release a joint statement. This hasn't been uh, the case this weekend on the seaside town of Biarritz. There have been several um, issues. One of them, I must say, is Donald Trump. His statements or the things he hasn't been saying is sticking out like a sore thumb. One of the first issues issues that uh, a lot of people have raised is his uh, position with Trump, um, with China, as you have rightly said. Before, he was saying that uh, he 
is kind of reflecting on these trade tariffs and whether or not he has made the wrong decision. That's what he said to reporters on the sidelines of a bilateral meeting with Boris Johnson. A few hours later, the White House released a statement saying that reporters had misquoted him and that the reason why he was uh, reflecting is because he wishes that he had been more aggressive with those tariffs. So that obviously didn't go down well with Beijing and it didn't uh, go well down in a meeting that they were having at dinner with the other leaders. Another pressing issue is that he wants the G7 to return to G8. G8 meaning that Russia under Vladimir Putin would be able to be reinstated in the group. They were kicked out or suspended in 2014 following the annexation of Crimea. That certainly didn't go down well with the EU leaders. In particular, the EU Council Chief Donald Tusk, who was also at uh, the dinner, and he said it's absolutely ridiculous and there's no way that uh, Russia would be reinstated in the group. In fact, he went on to say that he would prefer to invite Ukraine into uh, discussions next year. So it got a little bit uh, fuzzy there. And then, of course, there is Iran. Yes, uh, uh, Juliana, quite a lot uh, there. I Iran was also uh, invited uh, by, by France, uh, President Macron, uh, into the meeting. Uh, that was uh, a blindsiding President Trump there. That didn't go well. Uh, but again, if you look at some of the comments moving forward about currencies as well, some folks saying perhaps this is the time for Europe and others to come together to find an alternative to the almighty U.S. dollar. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I would say that uh, currency is, of course, an issue. That really stemmed from what Powell was saying on Friday. There was a lot of anticipation uh, from the markets to see what Jerome Powell was saying after that Wyoming meeting. And he said, look, you know, there is no monetary policy strategy that will combat the trade war between Trump and uh, Xi Jinping. And that, of course, is having drastic effects on the global economy. Yes. So uh, this is the final trading week uh, after today's bank holiday. Well, what's your outlook on the rest of the UK market? Is there any corporate news sticking out there before we wrap up the month technically and then we face September, October and November? It looks like all the timelines are set for double firing between Washington and Beijing when it comes to the territory fight. Well, of course, they're wrapping up that Biarritz uh, weekend uh, today. And then Boris Johnson is back. And of course, now that we are going into September, it seems like that long summer will be coming to an end. And it really is the countdown for Brexit in this company. Of course, as well, it'll be really interesting to see what those aviation uh, figures look like from the month of August. You know, the pound is really uh, bad at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see just how much people have been spending uh, having their lollipops and uh, sunbathing on the beaches in Europe. And then there have been several strikes, BA, Ryanair, several uh, big companies have been hit by that. So it will be interesting to see what those numbers say later during this week, Bosa. Yes, so, so what's the weather looking like? Some folks is getting a bit uh, uh, hot there in London today. Any idea what's the weather like this morning uh, using the tube, uh, getting to the studios at Cavendish Square in London? Well, very lucky for me, Bosun. It's bank holiday. It's a bank holiday today on Monday. So uh, I got a seat for once. Uh, pretty quiet here in the office and outside. But there will be millions of people taking to the streets later for carnival. <laughs> Business as usual here on Channels Television. Thank you so much, Juliana Layinka from our London studios.